Welcome everyone. We'll be starting in a minute once the last few people show up. Hmm. Still the last few people straggling in, in the waiting room, and we'll start in a minute or two. Mm -hmm. Okay, it looks like we're all in. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll start. Welcome everyone. My name is William Meadowglass. I'm Director of Studies here at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, where we offer a wide variety of study retreats and some special events and courses, which due to COVID are all online. And many of them are freely offered, as this one is. And we're really glad that you're all here. And I'm really pleased to introduce Jay Garfield, I think. For many of you, Jay needs no introduction, though I may share a couple things you may not know about him. Jay is a wonderful photographer. He's been a serious ultimate Frisbee player, and he is incredibly generous and supportive of many others who work in Buddhist philosophy. I first met Jay myself when I was an undergrad and a graduate student, and he offered to read any of my work and give me feedback, and he still does. And there's so many other scholars in the field for whom he plays a similarly supportive role. Um, I think many of us who do work in Buddhist philosophy are particularly grateful to Jay because as much as anyone, perhaps more than anyone, he's established a space in the academic study of philosophy for serious work that engages the great Buddhist intellectual traditions of Asia. And he himself has collaborated with and studied with many Asian Buddhist colleagues more than most academics. And he's been instrumental in the change that's happened in the last couple of decades as Buddhist thought has become more and more significant in the broader academic study of philosophy. Jay has also done a lot of work in many other areas of philosophy, including the foundations of cognitive science and philosophy of mind, ethics, epistemology, and the philosophy of logic. And he's also done work in the methodology of cross-cultural interpretation. He's also done a lot of really interesting empirical research um, and done some wonderful translations and commentaries of Buddhist texts. And if you're interested, you may wanna look at his CV on his Smith website. He's also published a lot of books and two things that strike me from looking at these books. One is that they cover such a broad range of expertise, which is really remarkable. And the second one is how many of them are collaborations with so many different people. Um, Jay and I have done two books together, but he has done books with so many scholars and it points to something which is very true about Jay. He loves to talk, to engage, to learn from others, and to work with others. And I am so very grateful, Jay, that you are here to talk with us. And I'm looking forward to this, these four weeks together. So thank you so much, Jay, and welcome to everyone. Well, thank you very much, William, for a far too kind um, introduction. Um, don't believe a word of any of that. Um, I'm just an old guy who likes to talk about ideas. That's the way I like to think of myself. Um, and, but I want to thank everybody who's here. I mean, there's almost 500 of you here now. 
um, which is kind of astonishing and heartwarming that people are willing to forego binge watching The Crown on Monday night to um, listen to some philosophy. I think that speaks well for you. Maybe not too well. I mean, The Crown's pretty cool, but we'll see what we can do. Um, I want to talk a little bit about what I'm going to do and how I'm going to do it, and then I want to do it. Um, I'll be talking to you for four weeks um, about what I call losing yourself, that is really understanding the idea of no self, of selflessness, not in the moral sense specifically, though we'll, though we'll get there, but not having a self, and of what it is to exist as a person uh, without a self. And I'll be doing this um, from a variety of perspectives. And one of the things that might make this set of talks different from a lot of the talks that the Barry Center uh, supports is that it won't be specifically or uniquely Buddhist doctrine. I will be relying on a lot of Buddhist arguments because I do that, but also addressing a lot of Western arguments in Western literature. And I won't be interested in doing a lot of textual work. In fact, I won't do any textual work at all, even though I love doing that. This will be really about the idea, about really how to understand the idea of not having a self and the idea and how to understand what it is to be a person. So I'll draw on Buddhist ideas and on non-Buddhist ideas, on Western ideas, um, but I won't be specifically giving a course in the history of Buddhist thought about no self, nor will I be talking about practice. This will be a very theoretical um, set of lectures, um, but I think what I have to say will be relevant um, to those who are coming here in order to enrich their practice, but I won't be specifically talking about that. Um, most of what I'm doing will be based on a book that is now in press called Losing Yourself, How to Be a Person Without a Self, that I hope will be out sometime next year. This is, I'm not shilling the book right now. I'm just telling you that what I'm doing is working on stuff that I've been working on recently, um, which is what I like to do. Um, now, a lot of people, when they give talks, like to talk for about half the time and then take questions for about half the time. I don't like to do that because then I end up boring you for half the time and then you're asleep when you should be asking questions um, because I'm not all that exciting as you can see right now. Um, instead, what I would like is for people to ask questions using the chat function in Zoom as I go along. And I won't be able to see those questions because I'll be working from a presentate, some presentation software. But um, William and our able host, Sarah, will be monitoring that chat and when there are important questions or places where I really should stop and clarify, um, they're gonna stop me and make me do that. So it may well be that what you ask never gets to me, and then you can raise it during the discussion session. But if so, you should blame William and Sarah for ignoring you um, in favor of somebody else, because they sometimes do that. But what they're going to be trying to do is to make sure that the most relevant questions that need to get asked at that moment um, go in there. You're also free to say something like, I didn't understand what you just said. Could you slow down and repeat that and do that more clearly? And that's a very reasonable thing to ask because sometimes I can be very obscure or I can talk too quickly. Nobody can understand a word that I'm saying. So if that happens, you can slow me down, make me go back that we're not racing through anything. We've got four, four nights together and we'll be able to, um, to talk about all of these ideas. So please do feel free to, through the chat, interrupt me. And that way we can have more of an interchange, even though there's a lot of people in the room, um, than me just droning on and on and on. So with that, I'm now going to share my screen, as we say now in the Zoom world, and I'm going to be doing a PowerPoint presentation, for which I apologize, because I know you're probably sick and tired of these in the Zoom world. Um, but we do need um, to do that in order to make things work. So now if everything is working, you're seeing the title slide. Is everything working? Beautiful, okay. So the, uh, this is the title for the, four, for the four sessions, Losing Yourself, How to Be a Person Without a Self. And we're gonna have, as I said, four classes. And this is the title for each of those four classes. So you can see where we are. Tonight, we'll be talking about selves and persons, and I'll be arguing that you are a person, but not a self. Um, in the second session, we'll be considering the Purvapakshas, the opponents, people who are arguing that, that, yeah, 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 Jay, whatever you said, they're still a self, and considering their arguments carefully and refuting them decisively. 
and hopefully in that class we drive a wooden stake through the self heart, idea's heart. Um, in the third section, we're going to focus on the ethical implications of all of this, because I think that's really important. That's why we do this. And then in the fourth part, we'll be talking about what life looks like as a person as opposed to a self and why we should take all of this very seriously. I should say that there's one thing about me that's very peculiar among philosophers, and that is that I don't work on ideas for their own sake. I'm not really interested in that. I work on ideas that I care deeply about and that I think make a difference to my life anyway, and I hope that they make a difference to yours. And I've found that my reflection on no self and on personhood has made a difference in my life. And so I hope that it makes a difference in yours. So one of the things I like to do before I start is just to set motivation. Um, and I'd like us to have a common motivation that our motivation really is to understand who we are in order to become better people and able to more effectively um, benefit others. And that's the motivation I'd like to go into this with. Sometimes there'll be sharp argument and debate, but the goal should always be to make ourselves instruments for general welfare. And so I'd like to collectively set motivation in that direction. So now we're gonna to start tonight's talk, Selves and Persons, why you are a person and not a self. And that's going to be a very important distinction for us. And we will get to that distinction later. So if right now you're saying, what's the difference between a person and a self? I say, stay tuned, you're gonna find out soon and you'll find out why it's important and interesting. So this has a few sections. The first section I call, who do you think you are? Uh, what a self is and why you really do think you have one no matter how long you've been practicing. Second, why you really don't have the self you think you have. Third, an exploration of what you are and that's where we'll really talk about personhood. So we're going to begin with a section that I call, who do you think you are? And this is where I really want to identify the idea of a self uh, that we're going to be uh, trying to refute and try to eliminate. Um, and this has a few sections. We're gonna first talk about snakes and elephants, then about this idea of the Atman, um, the, that's the Sanskrit name for a self, the self, that's the English word, and the soul or suke, as we might say in Christian theology. Then I will introduce you to my favorite illusion because it's fun and it will help us to get a fix on what we're doing. And then I will argue that in fact, you do really think that you have a self. So there is a point to all of this. There would be no point if we didn't think we had selves, there would be no point in refuting them. And then we'll try to ask why you think you have a self. So that's what we're going to do in the first part of tonight's talk. So first snakes and elephants. Um, and I'm going to begin by telling you a story that the seventh century Buddhist, Indian Buddhist philosopher Chandrakirti tells in his great text, Introduction to the Middle Way. For those of you who think in Sanskrit, that's Majyamaka Avatara, or if you think in Tibetan, that's Umila Jupa. Um, and Chandrakirti, when he begins his discussion of the self and personhood in the sixth chapter of Introduction to the Middle Way, tells a great story. He says, there's this guy. Um, who is pretty sure he's got a snake in the wall of his house. And in India, um, that's still a problem. And it was a much bigger problem back in the seventh century that snakes, especially crates, but also cobras, would, in order to get warm, take up residence in the nooks and crannies of the stone wall of a house. So this guy is afraid that he's got a snake in the wall of his house. And he's, in order to dispel his own fear, he walks around the house convincing himself that there's no elephant there. And Chandrakirti says, wouldn't this guy be a public laughingstock who tries to assuage his fear of the snake by convincing himself that there's no elephant? And what's the point of this weird story, you might ask? Well, the moral of the story is this. The snake is the self. It's the self that you really do, Chandrakirti thinks, believe that you have. And the elephant is all of the things you might convince yourself that you don't have or that the self isn't um, in order to really convince yourself that you're a really cool no self person. So you might say, hey, I know my body's not a self. I've really got no self down pat. Or I know my mind isn't a self. 
I've got myself myself uh, I've got myself really on the right track here, or all of these things. And Chandra Kirti thinks that a lot of the time, when we think that we're refuting the idea of a self, we're actually refuting something else. And so that the first important thing to do is to identify what that thing is that is the target of our critical inquiry. The great Tibetan philosopher from the 14th and 15th century, Tsongkhapa, refers to this relying on this passage as identifying the object of negation and says that that's the first step of any inquiry. If you're going to argue that something doesn't exist, that it's not real, that it's illusory, the first thing you've got to do is figure out what the thing is that you're arguing doesn't exist. So you don't miss aim um, your analyses so that you hit the right target. So what we have to ask is what is the snake? What is lurking in the wall of our house that we need um, to go after? And what we're gonna see is that that snake is this self, the Atman, as we say in Sanskrit. It's not my body, it's not my mind, it's the thing that has the body and the mind. In Sanskrit literature, um, we think of that as the subject of all of our experience that's never object, the knower that's never known, the witness that stands outside the world and sees the world, the agent that acts on the world, the enjoyer of experiences. And lest you think that's antique Sanskrit, anybody who's read Kant will recognize this as the transcendental subject of the first critique, the free transcendental agent of the second critique, or the completely free aesthetic subject of the third critique. So you don't have to be Indian to think that there's an Atman. You can be Prussian as well. But the real moral of the story is you can be anybody. Um, Chandra Kirti thinks that we all have this idea that we are something that lies behind our experience, that we are enduring, that we are subject, witnesses, agents. Um, and the important thing to point out is that when we think of the self this way, the self isn't my body or my mind. I don't take my body to be myself, and we're going to see that in a moment. But I think of the self, the target of this analysis, the snake in the wall, as the thing that has a body, the thing that has a mind. And of course, if we were operating in India and taking a doctrine of reincarnation or rebirth for granted, we would think of it as the thing that in different lives appropriates different bodies and minds, um, and, uh, but remains the same through those lives. But if we're not in a kind of reincarnation and rebirth kind of mood, um, then we might think that it's just the thing that endures through our entire life while everything else changes. That is, um, the thing that was me when I was an itty bitty baby, when I was a young, handsome guy, when now that I'm an old guy, um, that it's, there's something continuous there. And we think of that as the self. Um, the question is, what's the elephant, if that's what, what, the, what the snake is? And the idea of the elephant for Chandra Kirti is, the elephant is when we identify ourselves with any one of our psychophysical constituents, like maybe our body, or maybe our thought process, or maybe our perceptions, or our sensations, or our emotions, or our personality trait, or our possessions, or something like that. When we say, okay, I think that's what the self is, and I'm going to convince you that I'm not that. That's what the elephant is. And we want to avoid refuting the elephant when it's really important to refute the snake. The other way to think about the elephant is it's the, it could be the conventional person. And we're not going to want to argue that our bodies don't exist, that our minds don't exist that the person doesn't exist. We need to argue that there's no snake in the wall, that the self doesn't exist. So let's talk a little bit about that self, about that object of negation, before we go about deliberately convincing you first that you believe you've got one and then uh, refuting it. So first of all, we've been talking a little bit about how the Atman is conceived in the Orthodox Indian philosophies against which Buddhism counterposed itself. It's a transcendental object. It's not something um, that we actually experience. It's the thing that does the experiencing. It's not something we act on. It's the thing that is the agent that performs the actions. Um, and as I said, it's the thing which is reborn from life to life. The, in the Bhagavad Gita, 
um, the self is, de is described through a beautiful analogy this way. Krishna tells Arjuna, hey, you know how it, every night you take your clothes off and go to bed, and then in the next, the next morning you put on new clothes? Well, it's just like that with the Atman and your body and mind. For each life, your Atman picks up a new body and mind, and then at the end it throws them away, and then it's reborn with a new body and a mind. And it's that persistent thing that remains not just through a single life, but through all of these lives that's taken to be the Atman. As I said, it's the witness, the agent, the enjoyer. Most importantly, it's distinct from our body and mind. It's their, it's their owner, and it's a permanent, continuous thing, unlike our bodies and minds, which are changing from moment to moment. So they've got this kind of momentary impermanence. But also, as you may know, they each come to an end. We die. Um, but the idea is that the self just persists and goes on and on. Um, and most importantly, most, most importantly, when we identify the Atman, we're identifying what you are, your essence or your core. And so we might think, I change a lot, my thoughts change, my political preferences change, my food preferences change, my friends change, but I remain the same as a self or an Atman. Um, and there are some quick arguments that we're gonna encounter for the reality. And I wanna give you just some warm up arguments. We'll talk about more detailed arguments later, but you know, one argument is an argument from sensory integration. So right now, you know, if, I, if I'm looking at an object, you know, say an apple, and I see that it's round and it's red and that it's sweet smelling and so forth, I don't have a number of different objects, something smooth and round, something red, something sweet smelling. I have a single object that has the properties of being red, round, sweet smelling, slightly heavy, and so forth. Each of my senses gives me different information, but I represent them as, uh, as pertaining to a single object. So one argument is, in order to bind together the information I get from different sensory modalities, there's got to be a self to which they all refer that's doing the experiencing. There's an argument for memory. Since I can remember what I did yesterday, and I can anticipate giving the second talk next week. I remember that I thought about this talk yesterday, and I anticipate <clears throat> that I will give a talk next week. In order to have those memories, as memories of me doing something, or anticipations of me doing something in the future, there has to be some me that endures from past to present to future as the subject of those states, one might think. Now, these are all so far Indian um, ideas, but it, we have much the same idea in the Christian tradition, the idea of the suke um, or the soul. Um, it's a moral center. That is, it's the thing that really is sinful or pure, that's good or bad, as opposed to something adventitious and changing. It's the thing that knows. It's the thing that, um, that perceives the world and, and, and stands a subject. In Christianity, just like in, in the Hindu tradition, it's eternal, because even though my body will die, as we know in the Christian tradition, I will be resurrected to eternal life or sent to hell for eternal life, more likely in my case. Um, we also have views about the self that we get in early modern philosophy, views from Descartes, who argued that we've got to posit the existence of a self. Why? Well, because um, I know that I think. And if I think, I know that I have to exist as a thinker. And so that thing that exists as a thinker is not something that I, I'm casually related to, but it's me, the thinking thing, the self. And Descartes, of course, thought that that self was also very different from my body because I can immediately know that I have a self, but I only know my body through the um, doubtful um, operation of my senses. Um, so that's what the self is. And now I want to introduce you to my favorite illusion, which is going to be important because I'm going to use it as a model for everything that we're going to talk about later when we talk about the self. And that's the Mueller liar illusion. So here we have two lines with little arrowheads. And those two lines, those two parallel lines, are exactly the same length as one another. You can sort of line them up visually and see that. Um, but the arrowheads on each side make the top line look much larger than the bottom line. And the amazing thing about the Mueller liar illusion, one of the reasons I like it, is A, it's really easy to draw, and B, um, even if you know that it's an illusion, you're totally sucked into it. So um, 
And I'm just always amazed by that, right? You can just draw this illusion for somebody, draw the parallel lines, the same length, they see that, draw the arrowheads, and all of a sudden the lines change in apparent length. And I use this because it, um, it illustrates an important thing about an illusion. And this is something that we find again from India as a definition of an illusion. An illusion is something that exists in one way, but appears to us in a different way. Or if we're being very technical, we would say something whose mode of existence and mode of appearance are discordant. But that is just atrociously technical and Sanskritic. Um, so these two lines exist as equally long, but they appear to be of unequal lengths. And that would, that's what makes them an illusion. A mirage exists as a refraction pattern of light, but appears to be water. So whenever we get that difference between a mode of appearance and a mode of existence, we have an example of illusion. And I say that because I want to argue that the self is an illusion, that we exist in one way, that is as persons, but we appear to exist as selves. And so we have to come to understand that illusion in order to begin dispelling it. All of this is still whiffing on Chandrakirti's snake. Um, the imp other important thing to note is that even knowing that an illusion is an illusion doesn't get rid of it. As a, an old psychoanalyst friend of mine said of his craft, it just adds insight to injury. Um, that is, we, we can know that the illusion, the Mueller liar illusion is an illusion. We can draw it ourselves a hundred times, but knowing that doesn't make it go away. And that's because that illusion is perceptual, not conceptual. It's a, we're absolutely wired to see things that way. And it may well be that we are wired or badly wired um, to see ourselves as selves instead of as persons. But we'll think about that later. What I do want you to constantly think about though is the Mueller liar illusion as a model or an analogy for the illusion of the self. So, I want to convince you now that you really do think you have a self, no matter how many years you've been practicing. Okay, first thing, we're going to do this with a couple of thought experiments. And the neat things about thought experiments that I like is you can imagine impossible stuff, um, just like you can dream impossible stuff. You might not, not be able to see impossible stuff, but you can imagine stuff that makes no sense at all. And that's what I'm going to ask you to do right now. Um, and thought experiments are sometimes taken to show that something's possible. I don't think that's true. I don't think you can ever show that something is possible by imagining it. But what you can show is something psychological, namely that you could believe that it's so, even if it's not so. And so now I want to do the first thought experiment to help you convince yourself that you've got a self. And this one can get a little bit personal, and I'm not going to ask you any personal questions, though I'll divulge something deeply personal about myself. Um, what I want you to do is to now imagine somebody whose body you would like to have as your own, either for a few minutes or maybe long term. I'm not going to ask you why you want that body. I don't want to get that deep into your psyche. And that might be very personal. Um, but I'll tell you whose body I'd like to have and for how long, just to give you a warm up feel for this. I really would like to have Usain Bolt's body of a few years ago for 9.6 seconds, because I would love to know what it feels like to run 100 meters that fast. Now, when I form that desire, I think that's a coherent desire. How do I, why do I think that? Because I really do desire it. I would love it. I'd pay a lot of money to do it. Um, but what I don't want is to be Usain Bolt, because Usain Bolt is already Usain Bolt, and that doesn't do me any good. Um, what I want is to be me, Jay, with Usain Bolt's body, so I can know what it feels like to run really, really fast. Now, I'm not claiming that this is a coherent desire. I'm not claiming that it's possible for me to remain Jay and have Usain Bolt's body, but I am claiming that I can desire it. And if you are anything like me, for some body or other, you can desire to have it for some time or other. If you can form that desire, then you, in deep in your gut, don't believe that you are your body. You believe that you have a body and that you might have a different body, just like you might have a different hat or a different cat. Um, and if you believe that, then you really do believe that whatever you are, you are not your body. 
Now, you might think, well, that's obviously true. I've never thought I was my body, um, but maybe I'm my mind. I don't think you really believe that either. And I want to do the same thought experiment to convince you of that. Now I want you to think about somebody's <laughs> mind that you'd really like to have. Maybe not for a long time, maybe only for a few minutes. Um, I'll tell you mine again. I'm really big in divulging, you know, hyper-sharing, over-sharing personal secrets. Um, I would really love to have Stephen Hawking's mind when he was still alive, of course, not now. Um, and I'd like to have it only for about five or 10 minutes because what I would really like is to be able to really understand quantum gravity. And I can't really understand it, but if I had Stephen Hawking's mind for a few minutes, then I could understand it. Now, I obviously don't want to be Stephen Hawking. For one thing, he's dead. For another thing, he was already Stephen Hawking and it didn't do me a damn bit of good. What I want is to be me, Jay, with his mind so that I can use it to understand quantum gravity. Um, I think that'd be really cool. Again, I'm not claiming that this is coherent. I'm not claiming that it's possible, but I am claiming that it's a psychologically possible state to be in to crave somebody else's mind. And if you, like me, can form that desire, then you, like me, deep in your gut, do not believe that you are your mind. You believe that you're something that has a mind, just like you have a body. Um, and that you possess that mind and you could still be you with another mind and another body. I mean, just imagine having the same Bolt's body in Stephen Hawking's mind. That would be totally cool. Then I could understand quantum gravity while setting a new record for the 100 meter sprint. Um, but that's not going to happen, alas. Um, the moral of these experiments um, takes us right back to Chandrakirti's serpent. I think the moral of these experiments is that deep down, at an atavistic gut level, we believe that we are something that stands behind our minds and our bodies. That thing is the self, the thing that is not the mind in the body, but possesses the mind in the body. That's the thing that Chandrakirti identifies as the serpent in the wall. Our arguments are going to be aimed at that, not at our bodies, not at our minds, not at our personal identities. They're going to be aimed at that self that we really atavistically believe stands behind all of those. That's the illusion. That's the thing that causes us to be incompetent morally, that causes us to be confused about our own identities and to be confused about our role and our place in the world. So much Buddhist analysis is directed against that, but also some very good Western analysis. So much Indian Orthodox argument is aimed at showing that it's real as is so much Western argument. And so this is a real debate to have and the one that we're going to have. So I think Chandrakirti was right, that there is a difference between the serpent and the elephant, and that we do atavistically think that we are something other than our minds and bodies. And I think that the serpent is real. That is, the serpent is the illusor, illusory self that we need to get rid of. And so even if it's crazy to think that we are such a thing, and when we say it out loud, it sounds stupid and incoherent, that doesn't stop us from believing it because we are stupid, incoherent kinds of beings wired for stupidity and incoherence with the task of somehow trying to unwire ourselves into something approaching insight. So, why do you think you've got this self that lurks behind that? That's, that's, that's our next topic. Um, Tsongkhapa, who I mentioned earlier, identifies in his great book on the essence of hermeneutics, two different kinds of self-grasping, two different attitudes that you might have towards yourself. He calls them innate self-grasping and self-grasping due to bad philosophy. Um, and Tsongkhapa argues there that philosophical self-grasping is really an attempt to make really good intellectual sense out of a deep illusion. You can imagine that as somebody saying, gosh, what I'm going to figure out is how drawing arrowheads on lines makes one line longer and one, another line shorter, right? That's a dumb idea, right? But you can imagine people trying to do that. Or somebody saying, I wonder how deep the water is in that mirage over there. That's what Tsongkhapa thinks we're doing when we're really philosophically arguing that there's a self. We're trying to make coherent an atavistic primitive illusion. But there's also that innate self-grasping that gives rise to that illusion. Tsongkhapa says it's re actually really easy to get rid of philosophical self-grasping. Philosophical self-grasping arises from bad philosophy 
and you can cure it by doing good philosophy. So by the end of these four lectures, you'll never believe in a philosophical argument for the self. I'm sure of that. But innate self-grasping, he thinks, requires very long time of practice to try to effectively rewire the way that we understand the world. Um, Late, uh, earlier than that in India, but a lot later than Chandrakirti, um, a philosopher named Shantideva, who, um, like Chandrakirti, taught at the university you're seeing in my virtual background, Nalanda University, um, argued in his wonderful text called How to Lead an Awakened Life, Bodhicharya Avatara, um, that the fear of death is really um, deeply implicated in our urge to posit a self. And the 20th and 21st century um, sociologist, um, Ernest Becker, has made a lot, of, has offered the same kind of argument, which he calls terror management theory. Um, Chandra, uh, Shantideva, rather, in the beginning of how to awaken, uh, how to lead an awakened life, talks about how terrified we are of death, how terrified we are of being nothing, how terrified we are of what's going to happen after death. Becker talks about the same thing. And Shantideva argues that in order to save ourselves from that terror, what we do is we try to pause it, make permanent, and self safeguard the self. Becker does the same thing, says we tend to reify ourselves as a ball work um, against terror to somehow manage our terror. Um, but in any case, self does seem a self-illusion. I think, I think that idea is quite right, by the way, that, that the fear of death, which is deeply wired into us, causes us to posit that self, causes us to say, hey, maybe it can live forever. Maybe it can be reborn life after life after life. Maybe it can go to heaven, things like that. But I also think the idea that affect is deeply related to our sense of self is really there. Shantideva makes this point as well, as does David Hume. Um, Shantideva uh, points out that here's when you really decide you've got a self. It's when somebody insults you or hurts you, right? So somebody says, Garfield, you idiot and asshole. And I immediately say, wait a minute, I'm a whole lot better than that. How dare you talk to me like that? I don't feel like my body's been insulted. I don't feel like my mind has been insulted. I don't feel like my perceptions or sensations have been insulted. I feel like I, the thing that's got those things has been insulted and I want revenge at that point. So that kind of affect there. Or if you do something really cool, like win the Olympic gold medal, in a hundred meter sprint, like I would love to do um, with Usain Bolt's body. Um, then you think when you're really proud of what you've done, the pride attaches not to my body, not to my mind, but to me. So this idea that affect really brings up that sense of self, I think is really important. Uh, Hume uh, makes the same point in his treatise of human nature. For those of you who want to see this done in Western philosophy, he thinks that it's pride and shame that really bring up the idea of the self. You know, I mean, when I'm ashamed of something that, I'm done, that I've done, I'm not ashamed of my hand that wrote badly. I'm ashamed of me for having bad pen, penmanship. If I didn't give to a beggar, I'm not ashamed that my mind did something wrong. I'm ashamed that I, did, so I was tight-fisted. Um, and so the idea that these, these affects bring up the idea of self, I think, is very powerful. And of course, anger, as I said earlier, is another big one. All of these involve egocentric attachment. So it's when we're attached to things in a way that really fronts our ego as the possessor, then we find that we're positing that self. And so this finishes the first of the three things I wanted to do this evening. First was to convince you that you really do think you're a self, to explain what that self is, and to give some idea of why I think that you have, why I think that you think that you have a self, um, no matter how much you might reject that idea on reflection. So now we'll turn to the second part, which is arguing that in fact, you don't have a self. Let me pause and ask um, William and Sarah, are there any questions or requests for me to go over anything since this is a nice juncture when I could um, talk about things I've talked about? There are no questions yet to review anything that you've gone over. There's an interesting question about non-duality, but I'm not sure fits into the trajectory of your talk at this well, point. We will hit duality and non-duality later, but we're not going to hit it quite yet. We will uh, be talking about that probably in um, the second uh, lecture a lot, and then also in the fourth lecture. I promise we will get there. Can't do everything, in, can't do everything first, but thank you for that. But we will get there, I promise. Okay, let's talk about why you've got no self. Now we're going to start the real refutation work um, that we hope to do. And but Jay... Yes. Jay, there is a request to slow down a little bit. Oh, okay. Thank you. 
I will do that. Um, do me a favor, William, since I can see you out of the corner of my eye. If I start going too quickly, just do this like a nice metronome and get me back to 60 beats per second, okay? If I can go at about Andante, it's probably about right. And I've probably been going Allegro. So try to keep me at Andante, okay? I'm gonna rely on you. Great. There Thank is also one quick one request to see the previous slide, the slide just before this one. Absolutely, that slide right there. That's true, okay. So this is the summary of the reasons that I think that, that, that people psychologically um, have this atavistic innate self-grasping. Um, one is a way of coping with the terror of death. And those ideas come from Shantideva and from Becker. And then the general idea that the self is constructed not out of reason. We don't sort of think and reason our way into the self, but deep in our affective lives, which is why it's so powerful. And I pointed out that both Hume and Shantideva identify things like pride, shame, anger, and attachment as the kinds of affect that lead us to positive self. Jay, there is a, a, a question that addresses something that you talked about. And okay. that is that there's someone who's thinking, well, when I imagine myself as having Stephen Hawking's mind, I'm no longer imagining myself as myself. That seems like an important part of your argument. Do you want to address that? Yeah, I will address that. Um, I think there are two different kinds of imaginings or two different kinds of desire. And I really would prefer to think of this in terms of desire than imagining. Desire is a kind of more interesting um, attitude sometimes. Um, I have never desired to be Stephen Hawking for a host of reasons. Um, one is that I've been happy that Stephen Hawking was Stephen Hawking. Um, another is that, you know, Stephen Hawking had other difficulties in his life that I'd rather not have and so forth. But if I think of my mind, um, which I sometimes do, if I'm just not thinking clearly, but just being pre-reflective as this kind of cognitive instrument by means of which I know the world, just like my eyes are perceptual instruments by means of which I know the visible world, or my ears are auditory instruments by means of which I know the sonic world, if I think of my mind as a cognitive instrument, then I think I've got a pretty lousy one and Hawking has got a really good one. And I'd much rather have a good instrument than a lousy instrument. And what I want isn't for Stephen Hawking to understand quantum gravity, because Stephen Hawking understood quantum gravity just fine. When I'm desiring it, I'm desiring that I, J, understand it by having his mind for a little bit. I think I can form that desire coherently. Now, I must say that I do have friends who say they can't form that desire, that they can form the body desire, but not the mind desire. But my experience is that most people can form the mind desire. Um, I'm not claiming that it's coherent or that it makes sense, but that I can desire that thing. Um, it might be fun um, in the chat, to do a quick poll. Do you want, oh, we can do a, a, a Zoom poll, right? William, why don't you do a Zoom poll? How many people, no matter how embarrassed they are, can form the desire to have somebody else's mind or notice that they could have that desire even if they know that it's stupid? How many people say yes and how many, and how many say no? Sarah, do you know how to do that? We can do a Zoom poll. Oh. Okay. okay. So yeah. um, uh, repeat the question, <laughs> The question is, can you form the desire, however weird it might be, to have somebody else's mind for a little bit? Can you form the desire to have- To be you with somebody else. Someone else's mind. So Sarah, I'm, I got this. Yeah. Um, cool. So yes or no? Um, Everybody vote. You got to vote or I won't let you come to class next week. What do the polls say, William or Sarah? I've never done this. I'll see. Uh, I'll see if. Sarah, have you done something like this? Um, I have, but I'm not I'm not seeing an option to uh -oh. right now. 
Um, okay. but right now no, we're getting a lot, lot of hand. answers into the chat um, saying yes. A couple no's sprinkled here and there, but it's uh, yes, I'll bet. Yep. overwhelming. Yeah. Okay. I rest my case. There might be some people who are just too profound to be able to form this desire, but they are few and far between. If you are one of those, count yourself highly realized. J Jay. Yeah. Jamie Hubbard is up in Kyoto in the middle of the night, and I wow. can't resist ask, asking his question, what are the technical terms in Sanskrit or Tibetan for innate versus philosophical self-grasping? Um, in, um, in Tibetan, uh, it's Lenke Ngardzin for innate self-grasping and Tawaki Ngardzin for philosophical self-grasping. I don't know this, I don't know the Sanskrit. He was suggesting maybe Place of Varana and Jhana Varana, but. I, that would make perfect sense, but I won't vouch for that. Okay. Okay, shall I move on? Yeah, why don't we move on? I'll move on. Thank you very much for those questions and keep the questions and responses coming. And I'm always happy to stop at any point to respond. So why you have no self? I'm going to offer three kinds of discussions here. First, some Buddhist arguments, then some Humean arguments, um, and then we'll talk about the self as an illusion. So one other thing I should confess about myself um, is that my mind tends to orbit around very particular philosophers. And in India, it orbits very tightly around Chandrakirti um, and in the Western tradition around David Hume. And so you're going to see a lot of Chandrakirti and a lot of Hume coming out in these lectures. I apologize for that for those of you who don't like those guys as much as I do. So first we'll talk about some Buddhist arguments against the self. Um, and I wanna begin with King Melinda's chariot. This might be familiar to many of you, but it's um, worth reminding ourselves of how it goes. Um, the Melinda Panya, the questions of King Melinda is a wonderful text from early in the present millennium, probably first or second century. Um, and it's a written as a kind of dialogue between a possibly fictional monk named Nagasena and a definitely real ruler um, of a Bactrian, a Greek kingdom in, uh, in Gandhara, um, named in, in the text in Pali Melinda, but in, in Greek his name was Menander. And um, it's a very large and wonderful text. We're only going to talk about a tiny piece of it. And at the beginning, near the beginning of the dialogue, um, Nagasena shows up with a bunch of friends at uh, Menander's palace. And the king asks Nagasena a really obvious and simple question. He says, who are you? Right? Who, who are you? What are you doing here, man? Um, and that's a kind of question we ask each other all the time. But Nagasena, um, being a character in a Buddhist dialogue, says, well, I'm called Nagasena. But that doesn't really refer to anything. There really is no thing that I am. There's Nagasena is just a name. And the king rolls his eyes and says, oh, come on. Um, you can't tell me that you don't exist, that all, you, all there is is a name. If you don't exist, who am I supposed to offer robes to at the end of this audience? Who are we supposed to be giving alms to? Who are we supposed to have respect for? Who am I talking to in the first place? Who are you even to say that you don't exist, right? Give me a break. You've got to be something more than just a name. And Nagasena says, well, King, let me ask you a question. How did you come to the palace today? Did you walk on foot um, over all of those hot, hard paths and stones? Or did you ride in a chariot? And the king said, well, I'm a king, so uh, like I came here in a chariot. And Melinda says, well, okay, king, I wanna find out what that chariot is. Is the chariot identical to its wheels? King says, no, the chariot's not identical to its wheels. Is it identical to the shaft? No, not to the shaft. Is it identical to the seat? No, not to the seat, and so on and so forth. And Melinda says, okay, so it's not identical to any of its parts. Is it identical to say all of those parts put together? And to the whole collection of the parts. And the king says, no, it's not the collection of the parts, because if the parts were all on the ground, it wouldn't be a chariot. And I always say anybody who's ever bought a Sears garden cart knows that for sure, right? You open it up and all those parts are on the ground. You do not have a cart. You have a day of hell, right? That's really different. Um, so the king says, no, the parts can't be identical to the parts. 
Um, and uh, Nagasena says, well, how about all the parts put together? And the king thinks, it doesn't, I can't be that either. Because, you know, you can replace the parts. I could take the wheel off and put a, a better wheel on. I could reupholster the seat and I'd still have the same chariot. And so Nagasena says, well, is it something different from the parts? Well, no, it can't be anything different from the parts. Because if you take away all the parts, you don't have anything left. Um, and so Nagasena says, so your chariot's not identical to its parts. It's not different from its parts. It's not the parts assembled just so. Um, I can't figure out what it is. It sounds to me, King, like there's no chariot there, but there is a chariot. The chariot's just a nominal designation, a way we have of talking about all of these things as when they work just so in our life. And similarly, King, there's no me. That I'm not identical to my body or to my mind. I'm not different from my body and my mind, either identical nor different. It's just a designation just a way of talking, just like chariots are just a way of talking. Then the king says, yeah, 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 but if that's so, how could you possibly exist through time? How could you be something that's reborn? Because of course this is happening in India in the context of a doctrine of rebirth. But we could ask the same thing. How could you be the same person you were this morning um, in this evening? How can you be, plan to be the same person tomorrow? And Nagasena gives a different analogy. He says, hey, king, do you keep a little lamp by your bedside at night, a little night light, so you can you know, get up at night and find your way around if you need to? And the king says, sure. But of course, back then in India, there were these little tiny clay lamps that held a small amount of oil. And so if you were a king, you had somebody whose job it was when that flame was burning down to use that flame to light a new lamp and put it there, when that one was burning down to light a new flame. So this is a kind of you know, a possible uh, life as a servant for a king. And Melinda says, so you have a, a, a flame, and when, that fl when you go to sleep and that flame is burning, is the lamp still burning when you wake up in the morning? And the king says, of course it is, I've got good servants. But Melinda says, but no single lamp is, is burning through the entire night. The flame is passing from one lamp to another lamp to another lamp to another lamp. And he says, that's how it is with us. I don't need to have a single eye that's going from moment to moment to moment to moment. We can think of each moment of me as passing the flame on to the next moment in a causal series without us thinking that there's some single flame, some single bit of glowing gas that persists through the entire night or some single self that persists through my entire life. Rather, we can think of me as a sequence of little bits of light or little bits of fire. Buddhism, of course, is full of fire metaphors. That's a topic for another day. So the idea here is in the questions of King Melinda that we can understand the fact that we exist conventionally, um, but as neither the same nor different from the various constituents that we have, that we can lack any core or self, but still have a perfectly good existence, just like chariots do. And that that kind of existence is enough to account for our existence through time without positing a persistent self or a soul that is strung along through all of those moments. Now, Chandra Kirti, my buddy, takes that metaphor up, the chariot metaphor, in the text that we were talking about earlier, Majamaka Avatara, um, Introduction to the Middle Way. And he does a little riff on it. He makes it a little bit more tight and sophisticated um, and introduces what we often call in the Madhyamaka or middle way tradition of Buddhist philosophy, um, the sevenfold analysis or the sevenfold reasoning um, having to do with the chariot. And Chandra Kirti argues, look, when you think about the relationship between the chariot and its parts, as we're invited to do in the questions of King Melinda, we don't want to say that the chariot is different from its parts, because of course, if it were, then if you took away the parts, you could still have a chariot, and that doesn't work. Moreover, you don't want to say that the chariot is identical to its parts, um, because there's no single part to which it's identical. And if it's identical to all of the parts, then you'd have hundreds of chariots. Um, or moreover, when the chariot was unassembled, you could still ride it, that you would still have a chariot when you took it out of the Sears chariot box. We don't want to think of the chariot as the possessor of the parts, 
as something different because that would be a version of it being something different. We don't say, you don't order when you order a chariot or a garden cart from Sears. You don't say, I need two things. I need the cart and then I need the, the parts of the cart, right? When you get the parts of the cart, you've got all you're gonna get. Nor do we wanna think that somehow the chariot is something that comes into existence as dependent upon the parts because for one thing to depend on another, they've again got to be different from each other. Um, nor, as Chandra Kirti points out, do we want to think of the chariot as the parts arranged just so, right? Arranged chariot-wise, because we would still have the same chariot if we replaced a bad axle or if we inflated a tire that had gone flat or something like that. Um, so Ch Chandra Kirti also argues we don't want to think of the chariot either as identical to or as different from its parts. Um, but he also argues that we don't want to think of it as this kind of thing that emerges in the parts, right? He says, it's not in the parts either. And what he means by that is that when we try to understand what it is to be a chariot, we can't do that just by talking about chariot parts. We have to also talk about our linguistic conventions, our cognitive conventions, our transportation conventions, our social conventions that make it the case that that chariot is one thing, that it's a conveyance, that it's the kind of thing that we pay excise tax on and so forth. So the chariot doesn't just depend upon the narrow base of parts. It depends upon our conceptual imputation, which is an essential idea for Chandra Kirti that what there is in the world depends not only on things outside of us, but also on how we think about things. I call that broad supervenience, that the chariot doesn't just depend on its parts, it depends on the whole scheme in which chariots figure as objects. A really nice example for this, I don't like chariots so much, I like to think about this in terms of money. I call this the dollars and cents example. Dollars are real things. One dollar one dollar notes really are worth a dollar. Twenty dollar notes really are worth twenty dollars. Um, and you know that because if you try to buy something that costs twenty dollars and give somebody a one, they won't give you the merchandise. You know this because if you don't have money, you feel the need of it. And if you have a lot of money, you feel the overpowering urge to give it away. So you know that, um, that dollars are real. But dollars have a funny relationship to their instances. Suppose, for instance, that William and I are at a cafe and uh, we have a couple of cappuccinos and I suddenly realize that I left my wallet in the car. So I say, hey, William, can you lend me $2 for the coffee? And he does, and he hands me two $1 notes and I pay for the coffee. And then the next day I stop up at Barry and I'm gonna pay William back. And I do that by handing him eight quarters. And I say, here's your $2. Um, I've given him the $2 that he lent me the day before, but I haven't given him the two paper notes that he lent me. I gave those to the wait person. I've given him eight quarters, which he never gave me. Now, if we ask, is the dollar, when William gave me $2, um, were the $2 he gave me identical to those $2 notes? Well, of course they weren't, because when I gave them back, I gave them back in quarters, and the quarters and the notes aren't identical to one another. And by transitivity, then, neither of them is identical to the dollar. On the other hand, were the $2 different from the two $1 notes that he gave me? Did he give me three things, two $1 notes and then $2? No. By giving me the two $1 notes, he gave me $2. By giving him the eight quarters, I give him two dollars. So we might say that while dollars are real, they're not identical to the paper notes or the coins that constitute them or the electronic records in my bank account, nor are they different from them. Um, we can do the entire Chandrakirti analysis and it makes total sense. Moreover, and this is something we can see very clearly in the case of money, the case of dollars, Dollars are broadly supervenient phenomena. It's not the intrinsic value of the paper and the ink that makes a dollar note worth $1 and a $20 note worth $20. The ink and the paper are, have exactly the same value. Rather, it's something very different. 
It's the set of conventions we have for using those notes, for giving change and for purchasing. It's the way the Federal Reserve works. It's the way the banking system works. It's the way the commercial system works. If you took away the banking system, if you took away the Federal Reserve, then $1 notes wouldn't be worth anything at all. $20 notes wouldn't be worth anything at all. You can see this if you think about Confederate currency. We don't think a $20 Confederate note is worth 20 times as much as a $1 Confederate note. To a collector, they're probably worth about the same. It all depends upon their condition. Whereas even a raggedy $20 note is worth 20 times as much as a crisp new $1 note. What gives them their value is the role they play in a much larger system. That's what we mean by dependence on conceptual imputation. That's what we mean by broad supervenience. That does, none of this means that dollars aren't real. It means though that we can't understand dollars as identical to their instances, as different from their instances, as in their instances, as dependent upon their instances, or any of those other alternatives that the Melinda Panya and the Majamak Abhutal <clears throat> suggest. Rather, we think of them as conventionally real conceptual imputations that we create, but when we create them, we create them as real. The self is like that. The self is like thinking that there's something that is really underlying the chariot or underlying the dollar that gives it its value. And there are some very nasty consequences of the self illusion of taking ourselves to be selves. One of those is self-centeredness. Once I think that I'm a self, then I think that I've got a very different relation to me than I have to anybody else. That is the relation of identity. And I think that I occupy a very special place in the moral universe, namely the center of it, where I have a very special concern for me and only an indirect concern for others. Another nasty um, consequence is what I call self-alienation. That is, if I think that I'm a self, but I'm really a person, then I really don't know who I am. Just as if I thought that a dollar had its value intrinsically in the value of the paper and the ink, I wouldn't understand anything about finance, currency, or purchases. And third is the illusion of independence. Part of what it is to be a self, part of what it is to me, this underlying transcendent Atman, is to be independent of the world, standing against it, acting on it, but not being acted on by it, taking it as object, but always being subject. And so we get this illusion of independence and of transcendental freedom that really mistakes who we are and gives us very strange moral attitudes of praise and blame and anger and pride and so forth. So I think the self-illusion, unlike the Mueller liar illusion, is not only an illusion, but, but it's not harmless like the Mueller liar illusion. It's an illusion with real consequences. And so it behooves us to take the illusion seriously, to understand what it is and to try as hard as we can to dispel it. Now I want to talk about some Humean arguments against the self, but let me first pause because what I went, just went through is a heavy line of philosophical argument and there might be some questions. So Jay, there are a handful of questions that came up that have to do with function. Is, is money or a self something that functions in a particular way? Um, yes. I, think, I think that's a good way of putting it, but we have to be careful about the relevant notion of function. Money doesn't function autonomously. Here's a crude way of putting that. It's not like, here's a really bad story about where we got money from. We wandered around the world and we saw all these stacks of currency and coins around and wondered what we could do with them. And then suddenly realized that they were worth a dollar, $20, $50, 25 cents and said, wow, now we could form a banking system. Now we could start purchasing things with things that we know they've got money. We didn't find an intrinsic function in quarters, nickels, dimes, and banknotes, and then say, wow, finally we've got something that can do that. Let's start a banking system. Instead, we started a financial system and created currency to fit into it. So we can only understand the function of money 
extrinsically. That is, we can only understand it as determined by the entire financial system. Similarly, when we think of the function of a person or the function of a chariot, we can't just look at the thing itself and ask what's it good for. We've got to ask, look at the whole context in which it figures and ask how it figures in that context. So the function is always function in a larger system, function relative to a set of interests, extrinsic, not intrinsic. Great. And there's another really interesting question kind of about methodology, noting all of the metaphors mm -hmm. that the Buddhists authors are using and also metaphors that you are using. Yeah. And, and a question based on the metaphors, like, okay, so if reincarnation or rebirth is a flame being passed from lamp to lamp, how does one account for that drawing on metaphor? Do you want to say something about metaphor and how yeah. it's operating here? I'll say a very little bit because that's really a topic for, for a different evening. Um, I'll tell you two things. One is, a well, one, one thing is just a fact about Buddhism and Buddhist literature. It's just metaphor upon metaphor upon metaphor. Buddhist, almost, almost every single technical Buddhist term is a metaphorical term. Nirvana is a metaphorical term. It's the extinction of a lamp or a candle. Skanda, the psychophysical aggregates, is a metaphorical term. It refers initially to the wood on a funeral pyre, hence the idea of samsara um, being, a, being on fire, as we see in the fire sutta, hence the nirvana metaphor. There's just metaphor after metaphor after metaphor. You never escape them. Um, it's just the way that Buddhism articulates itself, and I think that's a really nice way. Second, I'll tell you what my, my teacher in graduate school said, was very fond of saying in one way or another. He said, philosophy consists in stacking metaphors, one on top of each other, like a house of cards, until the house of cards becomes too big to sustain itself. And then it collapses and we start building again from new metaphors. Now, of course, that was a metaphorical way of explaining the role of metaphors in philosophy, which I think just beautifully makes the point. I think that thinking philosophically is thinking metaphorically, and that metaphors are some of the richest um, tools that we have for understanding reality. And a lot of what I'll do over the next um, four weeks or the three weeks after this um, is to think through metaphors with you. There's nothing wrong with a good metaphor. Great, thank you. Now to David Hume, who gives us more metaphors, which is really kind of wonderful, lots of them. Um, and I'm going to quote a little bit from the treatise. Um, Tr Hume says in, uh, in uh, book one, part four, section six, paragraph one, that's how we read those numbers. He says, there are some philosophers, and here he has Descartes primarily in mind, um, who imagine that we are every moment intimately conscious of what we call our self, and those caps are his that we feel, and he's really outlining the idea that this is kind of a concept, right? It's an idea, you might think, that we feel its existence and its continuance in existence, right? Notice that we looked at both of those ideas in the King Melinda dialogues, right? Its existence, like the chariot, and its continued existence, like the flame, and are certain both of its perfect identity and simplicity, the idea that it's a single thing underlying the multiplicity of our lives. And then Hume replies two paragraphs later, for my part, when I enter most intimately into what I call myself, into what I call myself, note that very carefully, I always stumble on some particular perception or other, that is a cognitive state of heat or cold, light or shade, love or hatred, pain or pleasure. And again, you can see the skandhas here, right? Sensations, perceptions, dispositions, um, they're all there, right? Um, I never catch myself at any time without perception, and I never observe anything but the perception. So Hume is really trying to focus on Chandrakirti's snake, though Hume has never heard of Chandrakirti, and saying, you know, these people think there's this self that they're aware of, that they've seen, that they experienced, that's a thing they know best. And he's inviting you to introspect, something that you often might do on the meditation cushion and asking when you look inside, what do you find? Well, you find sensations, you find perceptions, you find personality traits or emotions, but you don't find 
a bearer. You don't find the thing that's supposed to be the self. So Hume um, thinks that you actually don't even know what a self is because it's something that you believe is there, but you've never actually seen, that you've never experienced. And Hume, Hume has this very radical view that we might have a word self, but we don't even know what it means because none of us have ever seen it. He offers another analogy, um, very much like the um, Melinda's flame that I've always loved. And it's the analogy of a church. I mean, Hume after all, is a Scot, not a Buddhist. And he says, you know, imagine you've got this church, a group of people who come together, maybe a dozen or so, and they build a little church out of wood and they hire a pastor. And then gradually they start dying off. They get buried in the great churchyard. New people join the church. It gets a little bit bigger. The pastor quits. They hire a new pastor. Um, the church starts outgrowing its building. So they build a new stone building. Um, more people join, new pastor. And Hume says, now, some hundred years on, when we look at this church, do we want to say that it's the same church that was once a small wooden church with only a few people, but has now grown? Can we say this church is really a hundred years old? Um, he says, of course we do. We talk that way, but there's no single thing that has endured through that time. The parishioners have changed. The pastor has changed. The building has changed. The graveyard has changed. Everything, everything that's constituted it has changed. Nothing has remained the same, but we still have a convention for identifying it because of the continuity, the causal continuity and the verbal conventions we have for identifying things. Otherwise, we could never say we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of the church. At every moment, we'd have to say, we've got a brand new church. We've got a brand new church. We've got a brand new church, which we don't do. Um, and of course, that's very similar to what Chandrakirti is doing when he argues that we try to posit an underlying continuity or an underlying substantial identity that holds things together through change when all we've got is change and our conventions for identifying it. Just like when I've got change in quarters, I identify them with dollars, with dollar notes. And I think that's really nothing but a convention. The differences between Hume and Chandrakirti are small, but interesting. I'll just point those out. Chandrakirti is really keen, and that's what the serpent analogy was meant to do, to convince you that you really do have an idea of a self it's just that it's an illusory idea, that it's an idea that doesn't have anything that actually corresponds to it. Just as we might have an idea of the difference in length between the parallel lines in the mueller lyer illusion, there's just no difference in length that corresponds to them. Hume, on the other hand, wants a slightly more radical conclusion. He wants to convince you that you're using a word self and you think you have an idea that corresponds to it but you don't. When you try to imagine what it would be, what it would look like, what it would feel like, how big it would be, what it would be doing, how you would make sense of it, you end up talking nonsense. And so Hume thinks that this is one of those many cases where we've got a word that we suppose corresponds to something in the world or corresponds to an idea, but we don't. As though, for instance, I were to tell Sarah, hey, I just got this really cool toy yesterday. It's a round square. Sarah says, what are you talking about? And I say, well, it's both round and square. Isn't that cool? And Sarah would say to me, you're using words, Jay, but it sounds like total nonsense to me. And she'd be right. Similar, or if I said, William, you know what I did today? I counted to the highest natural number. William would say, Jay, there isn't one. I'd say, of course there's one, I counted to it. William would say, Jay, you're talking nonsense. Hume thinks that when we use the word self, we're talking nonsense in exactly the same way. And I think that's a slightly different take on the self illusion, um, that it really is the part of the illusion as far as Hume is concerned, is the idea that we even mean anything by the words. Chandrakirti on the other hand thinks the illusion consists in the fact that we mean something by the words but nothing corresponds to that meaning. So it's worth pointing out that difference. So we come back to the snake and the elephant once again. Um, Hume is also asking us to pay attention to the snake and the elephant. The elephant isn't 
our perceptions and our sensations. He thinks we stumble on those all the time. The elephant isn't our body, it isn't our mind. Hume's not denying the reality of those things. The elephant is not our person. That is the fact that we actually move through the world and do things. Jay. Uh, yes. If I could interrupt really quickly. Earlier, there had been a couple people who were wondering if you could remind us once again of the snake and the elephant. They hadn't quite followed it. Oh, sure I can. Okay. Just, just this seems like a relevant time to this is a remind, great remind us. This is a great time. So now we're, we're talking about Chandrakirti in chapter six of Introduction to the Middle Way. I think it's verse 141, but I could be wrong about that. Um, where Chandrakirti says, imagine a man who is worried that there's a snake in the wall of his house. And in order to dispel the fear of that snake, he assures himself that there's no elephant in the house. Wouldn't that man be a public laughingstock? That's the verse. And so what Chandrakirti means is this. We have this atavistic sense that we have a self. And we tend, maybe, to try to convince ourselves that we don't really believe that we have a self by saying, hey, I don't think I'm identical to my body. Hey, I don't think I'm identical to my mind. Hey, I, I know that I really exist and selves don't really exist, so I don't really think that I'm a self. Um, and when we do that, Chandrakirti thinks we're whistling in the elephant dark. We're telling ourselves, hey, no elephant in my house, nothing to worry about. Whereas the self that we really think we have is that self which is always subject, never object, always agent, never patient. That self that is the enjoyer, that stands opposed to the world and experiences it, that acts on the world. The self that has a mind and has a body, but is not itself a mind or a body. That's the serpent. And Chandrakirti thinks that if we don't pay attention to that serpent, if we don't un understand what it is we believe ourselves to be in our heart of hearts, we will never succeed in dispelling the illusion. And Hume also is trying to identify here the serpent. And he's identifying it as the idea that the word self even means anything. So very close to Chandrakirti's position, but slightly different. Very important to point out is that Hume is not, in book one, arguing that persons do not exist. In fact, in book two, he's going to spend most of his time explaining what persons are. He's, what, instead, what he's claiming is that persons don't have selves, just like chariots don't have chariot essences. Um, persons don't have selves. So we need to distinguish the self from the person in order to understand this. So now I want to talk about that serpent and really focus um, firmly on what the self illusion is. This will be the last part of this little section. That self is supposed to be something that stands outside of the world, not something embedded in the world. It's the Wittgenstein, um, the Austrian philosopher of the first half of the 20th century, um, expressed this beautifully in his book, The Tractatus. He said that the self stands to the world like the eye stands to the visual field. We don't see the eye, but the fact that we have a visual field lets us know that there is an eye behind it, but not in the field. The self, he said, is just like that. We see a world, we experience a world, we act on a world, and that tells us that there has to be a subject that stands outside of that world and experiences it, just like the eye stands outside of the visual field. That's one of the worst things about the self-illusion, is the illusion that we're not even in the world, that we're totally transcendent to it. That's really weird, right? When, when you realize that that's what you believe in your gut. Um, that is, it's like the eye in the visual field. Um, that the self is continuous, that it, it doesn't stop. As, as Hume said, talking about Descartes, that it's always present to us, that it's conscious, it's the thing that's aware of everything else, that it's free from causation, that we can act freely on our motives without being caused. So when you go to the notary public to have a document notarized, and she asks you those beautiful questions, is this your free act and deed? 
And if you said, no, I'm being caused to do this, she wouldn't notarize it, would you? So you say, yes, this is my free act and deed. And I always just have my fingers crossed behind my back. I don't believe in free acts and deeds, but we do take, have this ideology about ourselves that, we're, that our free actions aren't caused. We just do them, as Kant put it, spontaneously. That we are independent, not interdependent. That when your mom tells you, you've got to learn to stand on your own two feet, that somehow that makes sense, that ourselves can stand on our own two feet as independent objects. Um, mostly the self is what I am. I am not my body. My body is constantly changing. My body was once young and fast. Now it's old and has a new knee. Um, I'm not my mind. My mind was once sharp. Now it's dulled and beaten into submission by years of overwork. But that I, the J who was once young, is still here in this old man's body. So when we think about that self-illusion, the self-illusion is partly bad because it's only a root illusion that leads to a whole cascade of terrible illusions. So now I want to really dump on the self-illusion by showing you just how dangerous it is. One is, this was a question that came up earlier, it leads to the illusion of subject-object duality. Because the moment I think of myself as a self, then I think that there's me as subject, and then there's my objects. There's the I and there's its visual field, and they're totally different from one another. And that the basic structure of experience is there's me, the subject who's always a subject and never an object, and then all of those objects. And I take that to be primordially given, to be the way experience just is, instead of being a construction or superimposition. So that's one illusion. There's an illusion of immediacy. Descartes was big on this one. And Udio Takara was big on this one in India, that somehow I know my own mind, my own states, my own being immediately, directly, without anything standing in between. But I know only know other things through the mediation of my sensory apparatus and my sensory organs. Nobody thinks that when I look at an apple, that that redness and sweetness are immediately available to me. We think they're mediated by my eyes and my visual faculty, by light hitting my eyes, causing stuff to happen on the back of my retina, electrical stuff happening in my occipital cortex, and I see the apple. That's a lot of mediation, right? And we think the same thing about every external object. But then if I ask my own feelings, my own thoughts, my own emotions, do I know those through the mediation of something? We think, no, I know them immediately because they're just part of me. And we forget that we know them through the mediation of our introspective senses, which are just as mediating, just as subject to illusion as any of our external senses. Um, we get the illusion of agent causation, something that Augustine makes very plain in the Western tradition. The idea that somehow our actions as the notary public suggested are uncaused, are free, and that there's a big difference between things that happen to us and things that we freely do, forgetting that our actions are caused by our desires and our beliefs, and our desires and beliefs are caused by our emotions and our values and, our, and, our, and all of that, and that if our things were uncaused, we'd be these weird random objects, but we think of ourselves as standing somehow outside of the causal nexus, even if we know that that is simply insane. There's an illusion of unity. This idea that myself is completely simple and singular, even though my thoughts and my experiences and my sensations and my actions are plural, that there's a unity behind that, that there's no, that the, I am exactly the same thing that I was when I began this lecture. And we know that that's an illusion. So these are all of the reasons to shed the self-illusion and why we think of the self-illusion as crazy. And that gets us through the second major part of what I wanted to do tonight. Now, I'm conscious that we have five more minutes, and I'm also conscious that the third part takes maybe a half hour or so to do. Um, so what I'm going to propose is that I'm gonna glom the third part on at the beginning of next time. We're not in any great race here. And I'll use the final five minutes of our time together to ask if there are any questions about the things I've just said 
or anything else field a few questions and promise you that I will, res uh, I will resume right here and eventually we'll catch up or we won't. Questions, stuff you want me to talk about again. Jay, I think there are a lot of questions that you are going to address in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, but- One, one, one question that has come up, um, is could you remind us about what self-alienation is and why this yeah. is so pernicious? Okay, I will. And I'm gonna take us back to this slide in order to remind us of that. Because this is what I really mean by self-alienation. By self-alienation, what I mean um, is our being in profound confusion about who and what we are about having an idea of what we are that is totally at odds with our actual mode of existence or nature. That's what I mean. So I'm alienated from myself when I think that I'm one thing, but I'm really something else. And <clears throat> they, these are various ways of understanding the content of that self-alienation. I think that I am toto generi different from the objects of my experience. That there's me as pure subject, that's one kind of thing. And there's that all of that stuff, including all of you folks, my computer screen that I'm looking at now, my dog lying right next to me. All of those things are merely object and I'm subject. So I think of myself as pure subject, as like the eye in the visual field. I know that that's not what I am. I know that I'm an embedded embodied being in a network of dependent origination, but I don't experience myself that way. That's a dimension of self-alienation. I think of myself as a, a being that I know immediately, that I know my sensations just by having them. I know what I think just by thinking it. I know what my emotions are just by experiencing them. And that none of that introspective experience, none of that awareness is mediated by anything. And that's stupid because I know that the only way that I can know myself is through an introspective activity. And that introspection is conceptually laden and that I can be self-deceived and that my psychiatrist might know me much better than I know myself, that my wife knows me better than I know myself and that my dog knows me better than I know myself. So I know that I don't have that immediate awareness, but I think of myself as having it. That's another dimension of self-alienation. I think of myself as a free agent who can act in a way that's totally uncaused, just by doing things because I will them, that I've got this free will that is unconstrained by causality. I know that that's crazy. I know that I'm a biological organism and that everything I do is caused by previous causes and conditions but I don't experience myself that way. That's another dimension of self-alienation. I know that I am a plurality, that I've got a brain with lots of different centers of activity, lots of different kinds of cognition happening at the same time of which I'm totally unaware, visual processing, auditory processing, language processing, emotions that are subliminal and so forth, sensations that I barely register. I know that there's inner complexity but I experience it as a subject of unity. That's another dimension of self-alienation. All of these are ways that we fail to know ourselves and all of them cascade from the illusion that we are selves. Does that help? I hope. Great. So there are a variety of questions, which it's about nine o'clock now on the East so, Coast. So then, um, is there one quick one or should I say good night and that we'll pick up here next time? Your call, what, William. Why don't we uh, pick up next time? We'll pick up next time. Thank you all very much for joining me this evening. If we'll, we'll pick up next time and continue this, um, this little um, story. And our next task, as you can see, is to figure out what you are instead of being a self before we consider all of the foolish rejoinders to this obviously true position. Jay, before you uh, take off, I think we put up the readings that you'd put together on the website. Oh, good. And so if anybody wants to read in a slower, at a slower pace, yeah. um, 
what Jay has put together. I don't know, Jay, if you want to say one yeah, a couple let, words. Let me say what that is. What that is is a few excerpts from this book called uh, Losing Yourself. Um, and my publisher gave me a stern um, limit that I couldn't excerpt more than 10% of the book. So um, it's a little choppy and it's really just samplers, but it's a way of reading some of my ruminations on this stuff. Um, and it's up on the website and you are welcome uh, to, to read that and to ask me any questions you want about it. And I wish I could have given you more, but my publisher was mean and started talking about copyrights and lawyers and things like that. So that's what we've got. And is it clear, is it clear what to read for next week if someone asked a question about um, which yeah, sections to read? It is. You'll be able to tell from the titles of the chapter excerpts what we're doing. I've been really talking this week about the uh, the first two chapters into the third and uh, the first three chapters. Well, we only got to the first two, but we're going to talk about the third chapter next time and then the fourth and fifth. So if you look at those sections, you'll be fine. But you don't need you don't need to read it because I'm talking you through everything that I would want to talk about. Okay. But it's and Sarah. Sarah just put the link to the readings in the chat. That's and she also noted that the recording of Jay's talk will be available in the next um, 24 to 36 hours for those who want to relive this experience oh, at God. a slower pace. That's terrifying. Thank, thank you very much. And I'll see you all next week. Have wonderful weeks until then. Please stay safe. Please stay healthy. And uh, we'll, we'll reconvene. Bye.